We've had a lot of fun over the, uh, the past year, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful to everyone, especially the governors who have helped us and participated in this, uh, this Disagree Better initiative that we launched a, a year ago. I want to thank our, our funders uh, who, who have helped us so diligently uh, to, to produce the ads. We recorded uh, 21 or videos with 21 governors, many of whom who are here with us, and we'll be recording several more today and tomorrow. Uh, we're going to talk later this in, in just a minute about some of the evidence these ads uh, that they're working, but I, I wanted to take a minute just to show you a quick video. Our country is deeply divided, and most Americans are tired of the division. Disagreeing better, not disagreeing less, is the answer. Nothing is less American than hating our fellow Americans. You know, people across our country have always had disagreements about issues. But what's most important is how you resolve those differences. And that's where, as a country, we need to do better. If you're willing to listen to the other side, you can have your own opinions challenged. Maybe you believe them even more, but maybe there's that chance that you'll say, you know what, I hadn't thought of it that way. I think it is possible to be productive, to change people's minds even, if you get people of different views in the same room. So it's okay that we may disagree on some things, but we must learn to disagree better. Our country was founded by people who disagreed on just about every issue. So we're not asking everyone to vote for the same person, read the same news, or even agree on the same big issues. It's never too late to be a better person. It's never too late to be kind. It's never too late to put yourself in someone else's shoes and, and understand what they're going through. If we can actually look at that person and what makes them up, uh, then we're much more likely to, to be able to have meaningful dialogue. They have a point of view and a voice. Who knows what their background is? Who knows why they have that, that opinion? Let's hear. It's not about showing the other side how wrong they are. It's about what's best for America. To think that a friendship that had lasted 70 years is now broken because of a political issue, that is incredibly sad. Politics is important, but it shouldn't define us or destroy our relationships. We're Americans. We're bringing different perspectives to the problems we need to solve. That's not a weakness, it's a strength. The world is missing its leader. America has always chosen to be the leader. And when you're the leader, you're the adult in the room. You have to act accordingly. We hope to speak for the entire country in saying. We don't always have to agree but we can learn to disagree better. Healthy disagreement uh, looks like people expressing uh, their strong opinions on whatever the issue is, and then sitting quietly and listening to the other side. You know, we're working together to try to figure things out and understand that we have different perspective on things, and that's okay. We believe in our country, and I think at the very core, that's really important. And we owe each other uh, a civil, respectful hearing out of our opinions. America is extraordinary and America is conflicted. I hope that we move past that because we could really celebrate the greatest country ever if we could find a way to work together. We should be respectful, we should be avoiding personal attacks, and we should be disagreeing um, civilly. That's what America needs right now. Conflict isn't bad. It's the way we disagree that matters. Together, we can disagree better. All right, well, now the question is, did any of those videos actually work or make a difference? So um, we're, we're gonna find that out now. I'm delighted to introduce Rob Willer, who is a professor of sociology, psychology, and business at Stanford University and director of the Polarization and Social Change Lab and co-director of the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society. Many of you know that one of the catalysts for this initiative was a video that I did with my Democratic opponent four years ago, which went viral. Unbeknownst to us, the ad was also submitted to Stanford for a study they did, the Strengthening Democracy Challenge, which studied the efficacy of 25 interventions that attempted to reduce partisan animosity. It turned out that our ad performed quite well in the study, so we decided as part of our Disagree initiative, we would invite other governors to do these similar ads. Rob also asked if he could set up a follow-on study to look at the efficacy of these new ads with governors from around the country, and they've been working on that study over the past eight months 
months or so, and I'm excited to, uh, to learn some of the results. So with that, please welcome Rob Willer. Okay, well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Governor Cox, and it's a pleasure to be speaking with all of you today and an honor. I can say, uh, as Governor Cox said, I'm a, I'm a professor at Stanford University, so normally when I'm giving a presentation, it's to you know, five to 10 people who are there for lunch, you know, uh, for the food, and they're avoiding eye contact. So for me, this is a considerable promotion. Um, excited to talk with you all today about Disagree Better uh, and this research that we've conducted over the last year or so testing its efficacy. And one of the reasons that I got so excited about Disagree Better is that uh, my, the central focus of my research at Stanford is on the problem of polarization. Now, I view the problem of polarization as a multi-level problem, and that that's part of why it's so thorny and difficult for us to intervene on. So we know well that polarization and partisan division is a, is a problem at the level of the everyday public. So everyday people, they're having to deal with political differences in their neighborhoods, their faith communities, their workplaces. Uh, you know, they're even having to deal with it in their families. As you may know, research shows that Thanksgiving dinners have gotten uh, significantly shorter over the last decade and that this has been tracked to more politically diverse families. So you're there, you're trying to eat the mashed potatoes, the au gratin, whatever it is, and you're getting into this argument with your uncle who supports the Tea Party or is a socialist, who saw someone on the internet, wants you to know about it, and, and you're fleeing the Thanksgiving dinner table to get away from that conversation. That's the situation for a lot of Americans. By the way, as an uncle, I don't know why it's always the uncles that get called out in this situation. Like, we clearly need better PR representation, um, but that's not our focus today. So the other level of the polarization problem is one that the governors here know well, which is the systemic macro-social problem. So polarization and partisan division, they stand in the way of us taking effective action on crises, emergencies, social problems, productive goals. Whatever it is we want to try to achieve using government and increasingly nonprofits and philanthropy as well, we got to go through polarization to do it. And the way I often put it to folks is we're all in the depolarization business. If we have any kind of state or federal level, societal level goals, we're in the business of trying to address polarization because we, if you don't have a plan for navigating partisan division, like you don't have a plan for social impact, not a complete one. So this is the nature of the problem. And when I saw the Disagree Better initiative, I got very excited about it, both because the, uh, you know, the Spencer Cox uh, Peterson ad from the 2020 Utah gubernatorial race was so effective in the Strengthening Democracy Challenge that Governor Cox talked about that we had run through my lab, but also because the ads, the PSAs that you all develop, the content you develop, seem to fit the problem so well, because they're multi-level. These are ads that have some kind of a chance to change the minds and the orientations of the everyday people who see them, to suggest a different way forward, a bipartisan approach, a way of respect and kindness towards rival partisans, but then they're also a way to intervene at the macro level, because frankly, you all are the macro level. Like, you all are the leaders of uh, our country. So, this is why I got excited about it. And so, I wanna summarize for you an experimental test that we've conducted over the last year, a rigorous test where we tried to take a few examples of these public service announcements and see how do Americans respond to them when they see them. And we embedded uh, several of these ads in the course of a, a, a regular political poll or survey. We call this like a survey experiment. It's very similar to message testing that you might do for campaigns. I did this project with Hagai Weiss, who's an early career political scientist at Stanford, really brilliant scholar, and then Don Green, who's an eminent legendary political scientist. We recruited 6,500 Americans to take part in this study, and we ran basically a standard RCT, where we randomly assigned these 6,500 people to either a treatment or a placebo condition. The treatment was to see three of these public service announcements that we grabbed from the set that you all created, ones that were about 30 seconds, that were exactly 30 seconds long and seemed like, seemed like they could be persuasive, and then others of our 
6,500 people were assigned to a placebo condition that had public service announcements that were chosen because they were non-political. We thought they would do nothing uh, in terms of political views. We grabbed three PSAs on anchoring furniture uh, to walls, which I can say as a Californian, I am like completely sold on this, having watched these now like 10 times. Like my house is overly fixed in this respect. Like everything is, is, is buttoned down. Uh, and so here are the results. Now this is kind of complicated statistics because it's sort of fresh off, uh, you know, this is brand new data or relatively new data. But what I want you to see here is that the size of the effect, the further this dot is from here, the, from this kind of zero point, the larger the positive impact of the campaign. So this is an estimate of how big of an effect viewing these public service announcements had on Americans, Democrats, Republicans, and independents, their levels of animosity towards out partisans, rival partisans, so Democrats' feelings towards Republicans and Republicans' feelings towards Democrats, just squashed together here because the effects are really similar. Their levels of receptiveness to having conversations with people they disagreed with politically, so basically role modeling the disagree better message, and then also their levels of support for bipartisan cooperation among elected representatives. All of those things were positively impacted from just viewing, just 90 seconds of viewing these three of these public service announcements. So that's, that's impressive, and I can tell you that the effect sizes that we see here are comparable to some of the better performing interventions that we found in the Strengthening Democracy Challenge, this massive experiment where we tested 25 different ideas submitted by all sorts of different folks from around the world. Now, this is great, okay, because this is the central focus of Disagree Better. We want people that see this to turn towards an openness to bipartisan cooperation, to turn down the heat on their animosity towards rival partisans. This is the kind of pattern we want. But there's other data, other effects of what these public service announcements might have on people that are also really relevant to this campaign, and in particular relevant to its life going forward. Because I, anyway, seeing these results and seeing these public service announcements and seeing the activities that you all have engaged in, I wanna see this go forward in some form or another. I don't know exactly what that'll be. Maybe we'll find out here, maybe we'll make it here. But I wanna see people beyond you all you know, state representatives, U.S. Congress people taking up uh, the Disagree Better mantle and carrying it forward and following your leadership. But a critical thing is, let's take seriously the views of politicians that are in deep red or dark blue, you know, districts or states, con you know, considering whether to join up on this initiative and seriously considering it. And let's imagine their perspective for a second. You might, you might be one of these people. Uh, they would be forgiven for having the following reaction to being invited to join in. They could say, look, I like this. I agree with this message privately. I'd love to join you, but I don't think I can. I don't think I can, even though I'd like to, and I am trying to do things to depolarize. I am trying to set a good example in my district or state, but I can't do this, and that's because I'm gonna wind up losing support amongst my base who wants red meat, they want negative campaigning, they want political toxicity, they don't want this. They're gonna turn, off, they're gonna turn away from me, I'm gonna lose support, could be potentially used against me even, and then I get primaried by somebody who would never do this, and you're not better off, you're no better off. This, you know, you, I get replaced with somebody who's the opposite of this message, and so you're better off just trusting me to do the best I can. I can't do this, I'll do what I can, but I can't do this. That'd be a reasonable reaction, right? or a reasonable, reasonable line of concerns. Let's take that view seriously. So anticipating that a lot of people have that line of thinking, we included measures of the favorability, uh, favorable views of the governors. I do research sometimes for political campaigns, for candidates that I care about or support what they stand for, and we you know, use the same kind of measures that we do there when we're testing messages or policy positions. And here are the results. We actually found a bigger effect on support for the candidates that were in the public service announcements, the governors that were in the public service announcements, several of you here, more uh, like larger increases in the favorability of views of the participants than we even saw on the direct message of the PSAs. So when people saw these public service announcements, they didn't just turn towards bipartisan openness, openness to 
you know, difficult conversations. They also said, and that, those people that did that were pretty cool. That was a cool thing that they did that. They did a tough thing and I respect them more for it. And you might think, well, what about the primary voters? They just want the red meat, right? No, if anything, they were more impressed. Like these are people that think a lot about politics. They take politics seriously, they're in it. Yes, they may be engaging, many of them in a more toxic way, but on average, when they see this way, we'll call it the way of grace. When they see it this way, they liked it. They were impressed. It increased their respect uh, for those of you who took part in it. Here's another way to cut the data. It's gonna be a little bit different. So here, the blue line represents, or all these blue lines are levels of support for in-party governors among participants in our study who were randomly assigned to that placebo control condition. And then the gray line is the people that saw these disagree better ads. And I asked Hagai to break this out for all the levels of partisanship of the participants in the data. Because I was most interested in the folks on the far right and the far left here, people who identify as strong Republicans and strong Democrats. I wanted to break that result that I just showed you. I wanted to see what would break it. Because I was suspicious that it's not real. That there are some people that are like, no, I wanted the red meat. I don't want disagree better. So these are people that identify as being on the far right. These are the people overrepresented in dark blue, dark red regions of our country. And here you can see that even in those groups, we see significant increases of similar size, maybe even slightly bigger size, increases in favorability towards the governors that took part in the public service announcements. And so the message is really interesting and I think compelling, you know, that it turns out we've got it wrong a little bit. Like people don't just need the red meat, you know? When they see this, they actually like it. They're impressed by it. They maybe didn't even know they wanted it beforehand. When they see it, they are impressed. They see that it's hard to do and that it's better for our states and for our country to take this position of, of openness, of respectful disagreement. It doesn't have to be agreement, it, respectful disagreement. And when we think about scaling this, taking this the next step, where it's gonna go, I think it helps that we could credibly say to politicians that might consider joining this, we could credibly say, look, you could be in this to, you know, because you care about the message, you could be in this because you wanna gain political support, you could be even in this because you wanna gain support in your base or some kind of combination of all that. And this is a good play for you. I do research on messaging for politicians in campaigns. That's a good effect size, you know? Like that's the kind of effect size we're trying to find when we're testing different messages and policy positions to advise a candidate in a campaign. It's enough of an effect size to where it's, if you were in the context of a campaign, you might consider doing disagree better to advance your candidacy. You know, it's, it's really far from what I assumed it would be, uh, and you might have too, uh, being a deficit or a potential harm. So, I guess I wanna leave you with one last thought because when I think about you know, why did this work so well, work so well in terms of influencing people when they, when they saw the public service announcements, influencing people to take up their message and also impressing them that the people in the ads, uh, in the, the PSAs were deserving of their respect and their favor. And I think something that all the governors here and it, mo most of you know better than me and it, maybe, it's, maybe it's too simple to even say but I have to say it, is that leadership matters. Like leadership matters. When people see it, they're impressed by it. They don't even necessarily know what it's gonna look like before they see it. And when you're in a position of considerable influence, when you're a politician leading a, you know, a state, leading the country, you're in a position to change people's minds about things. And when people see it, they're impressed. They're moved and the content was moving. Uh, so I think that that's why we found such impressive results here. I'm a social scientist. We don't put our thumbs on the scale. Uh, I was very impressed when we approached Governor Cox and the NGA uh, and they said, sure, test this, you know, because we're gonna write up the results regardless of what we find. And we're, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be able to publish these results regardless of what we find. It's, I have no incentive to show you uh, a rosy picture here. It's what we actually saw when we ran the study. Uh, and, and I think it reflects well on all of you, the leaders of this initiative, uh, for entrusting that to us and giving us a chance to evaluate it because it could, it could have gone wrong and it, it, it didn't, but it could have. And so that showed that you all wanted to get it right. And so thank you and thanks as well for your time and attention.
Thank you, Rob. Um, I can assure you nobody is more relieved than I am that we didn't just waste <laughs> a year of our, our time and, and energy. Um, I, I do want to uh, just kind of push, uh, uh, not push, but, but ask a, a little bit of your thoughts on, on kind of the why behind the, uh, these really, uh, honestly, it, it, these increases in, uh, that you found that, that I didn't expect at that, that level. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it, I, I mean, do you think it's because there's so little of this happening that it mm -hmm. stands out in a way that it, it wouldn't before? I'd just love your, your thoughts on kind of the why behind this. Yeah, I think, well, that was, you kind of stole my answer there, that that's a big thing. We tend to find larger influence effects when it's a message that's really novel, that's really new. So often when we get asked to create campaign messages that'll be more effective, we're not trying to like refine something the candidate's already saying a little bit. That's a way to make a small improvement that might be valuable. We wanna find the new thing they're not saying that's gonna maybe get you to a whole new level. And this is that, right? We're not hearing people say this. This is not the, you know, the dominant message I don't have to tell you all. And so I think it sticks out when people see it. That's why it looks like you know, real leadership. It's, it's also the case that all of the techniques and kind of mechanisms of depolarization that we identified in the Strengthening Democracy Challenge as really effective are present in these ads, these PSAs, to some extent or another. So showing people a relatable, respectful, sympathetic person from the other party, that's there. You know, showing that there's some kind of commonalities across party lines, that's there. Uh, correcting people's misperceptions of what extremist wackos are on the other side, that's there. And then finally, seeing a trusted leader from your own side stand up and say, this is actually how we're gonna do it, that's there. So it really, it had everything in it. So I think that's another reason. Excellent, thank you. Any questions from my colleagues? Governor Green. Thank you, I just uh, really appreciated the research. Uh, the question I had in my mind was, does it have to be uh, like kind of two people or can it be a dialogue that you have directly with your community or with your university or other entities where you just one takes it upon themselves to disagree better where there's been conflict in, in community? Yeah, it's a great question and I, I confess that we don't know exactly. Um, we would love nothing more than to get a bunch of your time to film versions of these spots that are identical, except we take somebody out. So anybody wants to volunteer a bunch of their time for that, <laughs> we would love it. Uh, my, my instinct is that it does help for it to be both people because you can role model that respectful engagement that way, uh, but that the second best would be for it to be an, uh, an in-party leader. Uh, they're able to influence people more than an out-party leader. So if it's a red state, having uh, a Republican politician, you know, doing the message is gonna be much more influential than a, than a Democratic politician. Um, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Governor Carney, please. Yeah, thank you. Very, very interesting though. I'm, I'm trying to kind of visualize or imagine how it would work in a normal campaign that any of us would be involved in and maybe there was some reference, uh, Governor Cox, to your campaign. I'm not sure what, what happened, but what would that message look like? Hard for me to imagine it in the presidential race right now, frankly. What would, it, <laughs> what, what would that look like? That's I'm fair. Thinking about yeah, I agree. Scaling it to the presidential race. I mean, it doesn't have to be getting together with the actual rival candidate in, in the race. It could be uh, talking as an individual about a track record of bipartisan orientation, you know, talking, you know, because it's gonna be hard to recruit somebody to campaign content from the other party, right? Uh, that's gonna be a practical near impossibility in a campaign context. So you might have to only do it as an individual and sort of say, hey, you know, I have an established track record of being respectfully oriented towards uh, folks on the other side. I'm a bipartisan leader. I respect all my constituents. And I take that really seriously. That's central to what I'm about, you know? I think this research would suggest that would be an effective way to gain support in a, in a campaign context. And, and I do think there are ways to do it, uh, again, as, maybe as we, we just did um, before a campaign where you get with somebody who uh, maybe is not your rival, but what we did with, with many of us, we, we did have some governors together, but in some of the other ads, we had a governor with a mayor, for example, um, in their community who was of another party 
and uh, they did something like that. I, we found that just having events, even if they're not ads, but having events on a college campus where you have two people of different parties talking about ways to, they, can, they can work together also being effective. It, it is harder, obviously, in a campaign to, to do something like that, and the incentive structures certainly aren't there uh, if, in, in large part. You know, I, I was able to do it with my opponent, mm -hmm. um, probably a little unique in some ways. One is that, you know, I, I, to be fair, in a red state, I was very likely to win no matter what we did together. But we were really worried, this was in 2020, uh, and uh, I had a friend approach me who was concerned about what was happening in our country. We'd been through a summer of discontent uh, where there were riots happening, um, even right here in Salt Lake City, kind of on the left. Um, she was also very worried about what might happen if, uh, if Joe Biden was elected, what the right might do. And of course, we, we saw January 6th after that. So that was some of the impetus behind that crazy idea. I just called him and said, hey, what if we did an ad together and uh, where we said we disagree on lots of things, but we both agree that we love our state. We both agree that we can disagree without hating each other, that we can find, find solutions. And that was the ad that went viral and kind of led to this, this project. So you didn't have to worry about it boosting her approval rating too. Yeah, the, I, I mean the, that was the concern. I mean, my team told me this is you know this is really stupid. Why would you do this? You're, <laughs> you're giving name ID and a platform <laughs> to somebody who has doesn't have any resources, and uh, you know why why would you do something like that? So again, I admit that not very many people are going to do what we did, but. He would also tell you if he was here that, uh, and we've, we've actually been on stage together multiple times to talk about the ad and how it went down. And, and he, he will tell you he was so grateful that we did it. It was one of the best things that happened. And I don't think it hurt me at all. In fact, I think the opposite happened. I think it helped me in, in ways that, that we yeah. didn't expect. So, Governor Mills. I, just to emphasize that this whole polarization thing is not just among politicians or people in public service or public life, but like most governors, I talk to hundreds of high school age and college age uh, people every year. It's girl state, boy state, high school classes and whatnot. And always, inevitably, somebody asks, the first question is, how do you deal with negative stuff? How do you deal with somebody who said, who throws mud in, at your, you know, in your face? As they perceive all of us to be doing all the time and they are hesitant, if not totally intimidated, from getting involved in public life. And some of these are high achievers, and you want to say, hey, come on, you should give it, give it, your, give it an effort. And it's in, inevitably the first and sometimes repeated question comes out, out of those groups. Um, and I talk about, talk about Republicans and Democrats in my state, Bill Cohen, George Mitchell, people who have uh, worked together across the aisle and not had to use foul language every other day, that kind of thing and how you can get stuff done, but boy, it's a difficult conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I talk to them about using words wisely and not taking the bait mm -hmm. when somebody throws some crap at you. I said, that's always a distraction. That's not the real issue. That They want you to not focus on real issues. They want you to be distracted about something that doesn't make any difference, you know, and, um, and to try to be civil, which is really hard. Really hard. Uh, young yeah. people are feeling this, or seeing this, and hearing this, and reacting with a great deal of hesitation about getting involved in public life. That's very disturbing. Yeah, yeah and that's supported by the data as well. And I'm just so happy we're having this conversation about like how to take this forward uh, and, and how to be strategic about it. And you know, Governor Carney's line of analysis is spot on. Like we're, we're going to have to be really smart to figure out how to get this message around a lot of electoral incentives that push against it. Maybe that means the bipartisan spots primarily happen in the off years. Maybe it means we come up with some kind of institutionalized structure where, you know, uh, people are pushed towards the disagree better campaign and they do it solo unless they both say they'll do it, in which case they do it together. And it's neutral effect, but it's better than the other, the other person getting the positive effect that you don't get. Uh, but, you know, we could, I hope we can figure it out. I love that. Ladies and gentlemen, can please I, give a round of applause. Oh, please, oh, Janet, sorry. go ahead. Les. Who, who said it? somebody had? Oh yes, yes. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry Mara, Governor Cox. Please. No, no, yeah. <clears throat> um, no. I just want to say I love this. Fantastic. And I wondered if there's a way to amplify this message and the results, particularly around favorability, because the point about the countervailing forces, whether it's our own media and what they want to pay attention to, or the cable shows who they want to have on and on what, even sometimes our own teams and forces and in, in where we go and, and who we spend time with. I just think it would help to have more amplification about 
this study um, and the results. And the other thing I was going to just ask is, was there any finding or breakdown around age or gender? I've not done that, but we totally can. Yeah. I was just curious. Yeah. Yeah, if you, don't, if you don't mind, Rob, we'd love that. And, and again, this is the first we've heard this, this data. I would love to share this with all of our governors uh, who, who aren't here, um, with everyone, because as you said, and, and I'm gonna take your words now, and, and um, it, it, it would be great if everybody just did this because it's good for America mm -hmm. and good for our souls, but um, I know it won't happen unless it's also good to help people get reelected, and if we can, or elected in the first place. And so that data, I think, is the most compelling. And yeah. Thank if you. I, if I could yeah, just please. Add, yeah. add something to this, <coughs> or wonder about it, from a purple state, um, mm -hmm. what we're talking about here are, for the for the most part, not purple, not purple states, mm -hmm. and and so, as you go forward in looking at this, I mean, right now, you know, we had some really good things happen in Wisconsin that uh, Democrats and Republicans did together, but it's difficult to even collectively take credit for that, mm -hmm. for right. Republicans and Democrats because of the sta status of our state. So it's not that I'm critical of this issue. I think it's really, really important. But I'd be really interested in seeing how that works out. We're always going to be a purple state, simple as that. Mm -hmm. So let's get some help here. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Rob, Rob Willer. Thank Thanks, you. Rob.